Hello and welcome everyone. Today's presentation is on patient self-inflicted lung injury. So what is this? We have spontaneously breathing patients in our ICU. This is increasingly common in ICU patients before and during invasive mechanical ventilation because paralysis is something which we do very rarely. So most of the time, most of the patients are breathing spontaneously in the ICU. It is relevant especially in ARDS patients accounting for 10% of the ICU admissions and 23% of the mechanically ventilated patients. 30% of the ARDS patients spontaneously breathe for the first day in the ICU. Now transpulmonary pressure and ventilation. Lung inflation requires the distending transpulmonary pressure to overcome the resistive and the elastic forces. The invasive mechanical ventilation can cause ventilator-induced lung injury with mechanisms including excessive tidal volume, inspiratory pressure that is volute trauma and barotrauma, cyclic opening and closing of the collapsed lung units that is atelic trauma. So there is a difference between passive and assisted ventilation. Spontaneous efforts influence regional distribution of tidal ventilation favoring the dorsal lung zones. This effect may maintain lung recruitment and improve gas exchange depending on the effort magnitude and the severity of the lung injury. Increased respiratory drive in ARDS is often exhibited because of increased central drive to breathe due to the systemic and pulmonary inflammation. Increased respiratory drive leads to higher inspiratory efforts and potentially excessive increase in the transpulmonary pressure during the inspiration. So it results in a vicious cycle. High respiratory drive causes high inspiratory effort leading to high transpulmonary pressure which worsens the lung injury. Worsening of the lung injury further increases the respiratory drive resulting in a perpetual cycle of damage to the lungs and ultimate death. So there is a difference between willy and p -silly. The healthy versus injured lung. In healthy lungs, the diaphragm activation leads to even distribution of the transpulmonary pressure. While in ARDS, because of intense diaphragm activation, regional variation in the transpulmonary pressure occur leading to excessive deformation and ventilation redistribution. So there is an occult pendulum phenomenon. The strenuous inspiratory effort causes early ventilation redistribution within the lungs causing an occult pendulum. The increased regional transpulmonary pressure can develop during spontaneous breathing even at low global tidal volumes and driving pressures. So there are hemodynamic changes that is this inspiratory, inspiratory effort lowers the right atrial pressure increasing the venous return to the right ventricle. At end inflation the maximum transpulmonary pressure increases the right ventricular afterload potentially increasing the shear stress within the pulmonary vasculature contributing to the lung injury. The cyclic exaggeration and interruptions of the right ventricular filling and ejection during the inspiration are more prominent with decreased lung compliance and vigorous negative pleural pressure swings. So the transpleural pressure and lung edema. Increase, inspiratory decrease in alveolar pressure to levels lower than PEEP increases the transpleural pressure favoring the fluid extravasation into the interstitial space. The tidal change in extravascular pressure and increased pulmonary blood flow at high intravascular pressures contributes to the lung edema potentially exacerbated during the vigorous breathing efforts. So this is all theory. Does PCL actually exist? Do we have any clinical evidence of something like this actually happening in our patients? So there are some indirect direct evidences like increased respiratory drive and effort is linked to adverse outcomes like worsening of the respiratory failure and the need for intubation. Evidence from RCT shows the benefit of interventions removing this respiratory effort. So NIV and ARDS outcomes. Severe ARDS patients on NIV often have worse outcomes. Lung safe, which had 40% ARDS patients with PF ratio less than 150 on NIV, the hospital mortality for failed NIV was as high as almost 50%. So higher ICU mortality in moderate to severe ARDS patients initially treated with NIV compared to invasive mechanical ventilation. So physiological parameters and NIV failure. Indicators of increased respiratory drive and effort associated with NIV failure. So a study of 62 patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, higher tidal volume was linked to the need to intubation.
a lack of decrease in the respiratory effort which was reduction in the inspiratory esophageal pressure swings up to less than 10 within 2 hours of NIV predicted intubation, PCO2 and intubation risk. Retrospective study of over 1000 patients showed a non-linear relationship between the initial PCO2 and the need for intubation. A sharp increase in the intubation risk when PCO2 decreased below 32 and persisted 1 to 2 hours even after NIV initiation was seen. During the COVID-19 pandemic in these patients, continuous positive pressure on NIV, the total lung stress was calculated. Higher total lung stress in patients required intubation, decreasing the lung stress in patients who did not need intubation. So spontaneously breathing intubated patients. A retrospective study showed that higher 100 millisecond airway occlusion pressure that is P0.1 was associated with greater dyspnea and higher 90 day mortality significantly associated with increased respiratory drive even after controlling for other clinical factors. Neuromuscular blockade. In the 2010 trial, it was shown that a 48 hour infusion of the neuromuscular blockade had improvement in terms of mortality as well as ventilator free days. The proposed benefit was the removal of this respiratory effort. More frequent pneumothoraces and barotrauma was seen in the placebo group. In 29 re-evaluation, though no mortality benefit was seen, but trend towards less barotrauma was definitely visible. Now, differences attributed to lighter sedation and higher PEEP strategy in control group in 2019 should be kept in mind. So this is are some indirect evidences that we have in clinical trials which shows that if the patient's respiratory drive is more or the effort is more then patient has more chance of developing PCLE. Now let's see if there is any direct experimental evidence to prove the existence of PCLE. So we have animal models where different animal models have demonstrated the harmful effects of spontaneous breathing during controlled mechanical ventilation. Spontaneous breathing improves the dorsal lung aeration but is associated with injurious mechanisms similar to Willi. Inflammatory mediators are elevated and negative pleural pressures that is strong respiratory drives during the ARDS. This hugely negative pleural pressures tend to develop a high transpulmonary pressure and cause more lung injury. So resistive breathing, mice with LPS induced ARDS and resistive breathing showed progression in lung injury compared to healthy and ARDS without resistive. So there was increase in the inflammatory biomarkers in this patient, in the mice. So a uh, Mascheroni study in 1980s, they do sodium salicylate induced hyperventilation in ship which led to significant lung injury in spontaneously breathing patient unlike those with controlled mechanical ventilation. This demonstrated hyperventilation was a key factor in the lung injury. Yoshida in a rabbit model they used high tidal volumes and strong uh, spontaneously breathing efforts and they found severe lung injury in these patients. So comparing spontaneous breathing and controlled there was increased inflammatory biomarkers more lung injury. The occult pendulum phenomenon. In injured pig lungs, spontaneous breathing caused the alveolar gas shifts and overstretching of the dependent region without any global tidal volume changes. This led to higher lung stress in dependent areas due to inhomogeneous distribution of the pleural pressure and distending forces. The Moraes study demonstrated the strong spontaneous breathing comparing to muscle paralysis and predominantly injured the dependent parts of the lung. Low PEEP created wide negative pleural pressure gradients leading to tidal recruitment and higher histological damage. Higher PEEP reduced these things and also the inflammation across the lung regions. Backman study in a model of partial surfactant depleted lung collapse of the pigs. Again, they showed that spontaneous breathing led to large esophageal pressure swings. Again, dorsal ventilation distribution and inhomogeneous ventilation worsening the lung injury. Switching to a protective model though improved the homogeneity did not actually make the patient recover from the lung damage that was already done. In severe ARDS models with ECMO, re controlled respiratory drive with low transpulmonary pressure swings and high respiratory rate with high PEEP and low tidal volume increased dorsal ventilation without pendulopt or worsening the lung injury. Now that we know that there is definitive clinical indicators of PCLE as well as direct models of animal models which has established that there is PCLE, how do we monitor this PCLE? There is an importance that because it is without monitoring, it is difficult to understand that the PCLE is actually developing. So de understanding the respiratory pattern and that it is becoming more 
is important. So we need to understand the respiratory drive versus the respiratory effort. Respiratory drive is the neural input. Respiratory effort is the activation of the respiratory muscles induced by this neural signal. High respiratory drive may not always translate to a strong muscle contraction because of neuromuscular transmission defects and muscle weakness. Clinical signs in non-intubated patients. Signs of high respiratory drive and effort are dyspnea, recruitment of the accessory muscles and tachypnea. These signs suggest but do not quantify the magnitude of the respiratory drive and effort. How to quantify this respiratory drive? To do that, we need diaphragm electrical activity. This is recorded by a nasogastric catheter with electrodes at diaphragm level connected to the ventilator software. It measures the crudal diaphragmatic activity through the electrical field produced by the motor neurons. The key metrics are the inspiratory peak value, the slope value and the neural ins inspiratory time. So the peak value is useful for assessing variations in the respiratory drive over time, not for identifying increased respiratory drive. Ratios involve the difference between the peaks and change in the airway pressure during end expiratory occlusion and tidal ventilation. Limitations are the electrical activity of the diaphragm measures the neural drive to the diaphragm only and not to the accessory muscles. Airway occlusion at 100 milliseconds that is P0.1. It is used in intubated patients for a comprehensive evaluation of the respiratory drive. This measures the negative pressure generated by the inspiratory muscle during the first 0.1 second not affected by muscle weakness or flow resistance. Normal value is 0.5 to 1.5, upper threshold is 3.5 values, above this correlates with high drive and effort. Uh, P0.1 level associated with dyspnea, increased mortality and prolonged mechanical ventilation. So how to quantify the respiratory effort? The difference between the is esophageal pressures and the muscle pressures. So the esophageal pressure variance. Contraction of the inspiratory muscle during spontaneous breathing causes a deflection in the esophageal pressure. This deflection corresponds to the change in the pleural pressure and reflects the effort magnitude. Physiological values are 5 to 10. Pressure gradient of the respiratory muscle, that is a P mass. It is calculated by the difference between the static recoil of the chest wall and the esophageal pressure. The work of breathing and the pressure time product. The work of breathing, it is the integral of the product of the P mass and the tidal volume. It correlates with the energy and expenditure of the respiratory muscle. Then we have the pressure time product, which is the integral of the product of the P mass with time. Now also correlates with the energy expenditure of the respiratory muscles. These things can be measured by P oc, which is the occlusion pressure. It is a negative pressure swing during the end expiratory occlusion correlates with the P mass and delta esophageal pressure in patients with respiratory failure. Average value is 0.75 into P OSC for P mass and 0.66 into P OCK for the delta ES. Now for detailed description of how you need to calculate these things in the patient you have with a ventilator, you can see our previous videos. The next is the tidal swing of the central venous pressure. In this, the breathing causes a cyclic variation in interthoracic pressure affecting the thoracic structures. The tidal swing of the CVP can serve as a surrogate for the delta PES in the absence of an esophageal catheter. The cutoff for this is more than 10 uh, for the esophageal swing is reflected by a 8 mm change in the central venous pressure. The pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Tidal swings in the pulmonary occlusion pressure is more reliable for delta PES than this CVP. Diaphragmatic ultrasound, so that is called thickening fraction. The thickening of the diaphragm during inspiration correlates with the effort indices. It, the supported cutoff is of high effort is 30% thick thickening. Recent study comparing diaphragmatic thickening fraction and delta CVP in evaluating inspiratory effort have been done. Both correlate with the inspiratory effort as detected by delta ES with delta CVP showing strong correlations. So how to monitor dangerous breathing patients? Tidal volume and respiratory rate. The initial response to the increased respiratory drive is increase in the tidal volume, unchanged inspiratory time and higher mean inspiratory flow rates. The response to further increased drive or muscle weakness. Increased respiratory rate with reduced res expiratory time. Rapid shallow breathing index can be used. The ratio of RR to tidal volume. Uh, 
the threshold of more than 105 indicates unsatisfied ventilatory demand. Asynchronies, missed effort and auto-triggering indicates insufficient respiratory drive, premature cycling, double triggering can be seen indicative of high drive and effort, reverse triggering can be seen which is reversely activated by mechanical breath which is associated with excessive tidal volume and leading to PCE again. The distribution of the ventilation with electrical impedance tomography. This in there is an inhomogeneous ventilatory distribution. This is seen by high respiratory dive and effort as a result of inhomogeneous ventilation distribution with occult pendula, tidal recruitment and excessive stress in dependent regions. So there is integration of the other monitoring can be done. EIT can be integrated with esophageal pressure swings to provide comprehensive bedside monitoring. There is you can do the data analysis and find various parameters which you can use to guide yourself and find whether there is strain in the inspiratory effort. So recognition of the high clinical factor is important because the diagnosis, once you have a diagnosis of if ARDS and you see patients with low PF ratios, then you need to find the ventilation perfusion mismatching or the ventilator ratio, the lower arterial pH, lower set PEEP, all these aggravate the respiratory effort. So the estimation model by Proti et al. develops a simple model for estimating high respiratory effort from bedside clinical parameters by all these things. And it shows these variables correlate with high respiratory effort in patients with high flow oxygen therapy.